What's up guys, Jeff from Sorta Healthier. In this video, we'll be talking about the muscles of the upper body and core. Just like in my other two anatomy videos, which covered basic skeletal anatomy and the muscles of the lower body, everything in this video will be very simple. This anatomy video series was designed to give you baseline knowledge, AKA you should know at least this much if you wanna work in the field. Of course, this video will be useful to those studying for personal trainer certification exams or MBLEX exams, but it should also serve as good review for people already working Working in the field as well. I'll be referencing a guide throughout today's video and that guide can be downloaded for free at a link located in the video description. Whether you want to download that guide and reference it as you're watching this video or maybe you just want to watch this video and follow along, you should be able to absorb the material that we're going over today either way. If you appreciate this guide, this video, and all of this free information, I would very much appreciate it if you would consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you have haven't done so already. That really helps this channel to grow and it allows me to keep making free content for all of you. Thank you so much for that support everyone. I really do appreciate it. Okay, so now we're jumping right into talking about muscles located in the upper body and core. And the way I'll be breaking everything down today is first off, I'll be showing you the muscle location. After that, we'll be talking about what the muscle does or the action. After that, we'll be talking about the antagonist of the muscle or the muscle that opposes the prime mover. The prime mover being the muscle, again, that we're talking about. And then lastly, I'll be sharing a fact or two about the muscle to help you remember everything. So we are kicking things off with the core and our first muscle is the rectus abdominis, which is the six pack muscle. So mainly what your rectus abdominis does is it flexes your trunk and that kind of looks like a crunch or sit up motion. Just like most, if not all core muscles, the rectus abdominis also aids in expiration or breathing out. The muscles that most oppose what the rectus abdominis does are the erector spinae muscles. And this should come as no surprise to those who watched my lower body muscle anatomy video, but the erector spinae muscles are on the opposite side of the body compared to the rectus abdominis. And that is very typical for an agonist and an antagonist for them to be on opposite sides of the body. And it's also separated by the linea alba. So you can kind of see it here, this line that goes right down the middle, that is called your linea alba. Next up, we are talking about the transversus abdominis and the transversus abdominis is all about keeping everything stable so its action is primarily stabilizing the spine and pelvis before movement. Just like before, what we just talked about with the rectus abdominis, the main antagonist here is going to be the erector spinae muscles. And the transversus abdominis is a very deep core muscle. It is the deepest core muscle. So really, it's actually just beneath the rectus abdominis that we just talked about. Next up, we're talking about the external and internal obliques. So a few things these muscles do, they both flex the trunk to the same side. They also both rotate the trunk and I'll explain more about that very shortly. So those erector spinae muscles would still be an antagonist here and there would be other antagonist muscles as well, but we really don't need to get too deep into that stuff. So I felt like it was a good thing to throw this fact in here. These muscles also help with respiration and protection. Honestly, all core muscles help with respiration and protection and pretty much all muscles help with protection. But of course you have a lot of vital organs you know, beneath that midsection. So yeah, all these core muscles are extra helpful for protection of those organs. Now, to be honest with you guys, I wouldn't consider this next slide crucial information, but I have seen it pop up on trainer certification exams in the past. Anyways, your external oblique rotates the opposite side or the contralateral side, and the internal oblique rotates the same side or the ipsilateral side. Quick example here, your right external oblique and your left internal oblique rotate your spine to the left. And you may have to read all of this a few times to fully understand what we just went over. Again, in my opinion, it's not the most important thing to know, but every once in a while, this will pop up on a trainer certification exam. Next up, we're talking about the quadratus lumborum or QL for short. So in terms of actions here, we're looking at extension of the lumbar spine and we're looking at lateral flexion to the same side. So the antagonist for the quadratus lumborum, it kind of depends on what action you're doing. That being said, oftentimes these two sides actually oppose each other. There are definitely other antagonist muscles to this quadratus lumborum, but that's not super important information for us to go over right now. So the QL is definitely one of those muscles that's likely to be injured or tweaked 
but it's not always the problem. I find very often that the QL is more of a victim rather than a problem. When surrounding muscles like the abdominal muscles or glute muscles are too weak, the QL often ends up paying the price. Next up, we have the erector spinae muscles, and we're looking at three different muscles here. We have the iliocostalis, the longissimus, and the spinalis muscles. So like we said before, these guys do the opposite action as rectus abdominis, that crunching or sit-up muscle. So they extend the vertebral column, and they also laterally flex the vertebral column to the same side. So again, like we said, these guys directly oppose the rectus abdominis. And sometimes these erector muscles are referred to as the first line of protection for a stable spine. And it kind of makes sense based on where they're located. They just give the spinal column a little bit of extra protection. Okay, so next up we have a big one. We have the latissimus dorsi, better known as the lats. And this one does a whole bunch of different things and it mainly acts on the shoulder. It does extension, adduction, internal rotation, and horizontal abduction, again, at the shoulder. When I say shoulder, I mean at the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic joint. Throughout today's video, I'll be showing you what many of these different muscle actions look like. I did break down muscle actions even more in my first muscle anatomy video, so make sure to watch that full video as well. It will definitely be helpful with learning those pesky muscle actions. So because the lats do so many different things, they do actually have quite a few antagonists, some of the more prominent ones being the deltoids and the trapezius muscles, both of which we're going to go over shortly. And a little fun fact about your lats, latissimus dorsi means broadest back in Latin, and I'm not sure if that's an exact translation or anything, but if you do want to make your back more broad or wide, one of the best things you could do is try to build up your lats. And now we're moving on to another really big back muscle, and this one is kind of shaped like a kite, course we are talking about the trapezius. Now the trapezius does do quite a few things and not all of them are listed here but some of the main things that the trapezius does is it retracts and elevates the scapula. Some of the main antagonists to the trapezius would be serratus anterior and pec major. And a fun fact about the trapezius, this muscle is responsible for many headaches and it makes LMTs, licensed massage therapists, a lot of money. Basically everyone always thinks their trapezius is full of knots and that it's this big problem area. Just like with the quadratus lumborum, that lower back muscle that we talked about before, trapezius is usually more of a victim rather than an outright problem. People slouching all day causes this trapezius to be locked tight and overstretched, and that poor posture can cause headaches since the trapezius attaches at the base of the skull. If this goes on for long periods of time, it can cause something called upper cross syndrome, which can be uncomfortable. And these days, unfortunately, this is a very common thing to encounter. Next up, we're talking about the rhomboids. We have rhomboid minor and we have rhomboid major. And these guys retract the scapula, they rotate the scapula, and they also stabilize the scapula. These guys, like the trapezius, are also blamed for a lot of upper and middle back pain. But just like the trapezius, more often than not, these guys are more of a victim them than an outright cause of the problem. Really, we just need to get people to kind of assume better posture and retract those shoulder blades down and back. Again, getting out of that forward rounded posture that most of us find ourselves in far too often. And the rhomboids are actually deep to trapezius, so they actually run right underneath part of the trapezius. So the next muscle we have is levator scapula, and levator scapula is an easy one because it pretty much does exactly what it sounds like it should do. It elevates your scapula, it also uh, rotates your scapula, and it kind of rotates your scapula as you're reaching your arm upwards. So in terms of antagonist muscles for the levator scapula, the serratus anterior would be one of the antagonist muscles. There definitely would be other ones as well. But again, we're not super concerned with that detail right now. And a quick little fact about the levator scapula, when the neck is stiff, very often this muscle is to blame. And that could be for a number of different reasons. Maybe someone is doing a lot of overhead stuff. Maybe they're doing a lot of reaching forward and overhead. But again, general postural stuff could cause some issues here too. Next up we have serratus or serratus anterior. And mainly what this muscle does is scapula protraction. So that forward kind of motion of the scapula. Because the rhomboids and the traps do the exact opposite thing, they do scapular retraction that would make them the antagonists to this muscle. Sometimes your serratus anterior is called the boxer's muscle or the big swing muscle. That being said, there are more important muscles when it comes to punching. 
punching power typically comes from the bigger muscles in the lower body and core, and some of these upper body muscles just transfer some of that power. Stratus interior would only really be involved in a quick jab type punch. Next up, we have pectoralis or pec major. Pec major also does a bunch of different things, and it acts upon the humerus or the shoulder joint. So it does adduction, it does some medial rotation, and it does some flexion as well. Pec major is gonna have a decent number of antagonists, but some of the main ones would be the deltoids and the trapezius. I think most people already kind of know this, but pec major is the main upper body pushing muscle. So if I'm doing bench press or some push-ups, pec major is the muscle that should be doing most of the work. It's also superficial to pec minor, so that means pec minor is deeper than pectoralis major, so pec major is on top of pec minor. Speaking of pec minor, pec minor is the muscle that we'll be talking about next. And one of the main things that pec minor does is it draws the scapula anteriorly and inferiorly. Anteriorly meaning towards the front of your body, so it's pulling your scapula forwards, and it's also pulling your scapula kind of downwards, so forwards and downwards into potentially a kind of rounded position. That's not to say pec minor is a bad muscle. We do need it, of course. There are some tasks that require us to be in that position. Because pec minor is pulling that scapula forwards and downwards, the antagonist muscles to think about here would primarily be trapezius and the rhomboids because they retract the shoulder blades, kind of bringing everything backwards. And like I've said a few different times now, this is one of the muscles we want to think about most when working on posture. So if we do have someone stuck in a very rounded forward position and they want to work on that, or they're experiencing pain or discomfort from that, stretching out the pecs, that can be really helpful. The door frame stretch is one of those simple ones that can go a long way with helping out with this. Next up, we have the deltoids and they hang out right up on top of the shoulder. When you think about deltoids, I mainly want you to think about shoulder abduction, but of course they do aid in shoulder flexion and shoulder extension as well. One of the main antagonist muscles for the deltoids would be the lats. And that's because the lats are partially responsible for shoulder adduction. And we already said the deltoids do shoulder abduction, so so that would be the exact opposite motion. Honestly, I probably should have wrote pec major here as well. That would be another antagonist of certain parts of the deltoid. But because these muscles of the shoulder joint do so many different things, we don't need to worry about every antagonist. So there are three different parts of the deltoid. We have the anterior or the front part. We have the middle or side part, depending at what angle you're viewing the deltoid from, and then we have the back part or the posterior part as well. No offense to the teres major, this little upper body muscle right here, this is probably the least important muscle that we're gonna talk about today. So the teres major actually does do a few different things. It internally rotates the humerus. Basically, it assists a lot of different things that the latissimus dorsi, the lats do. So teres major is really just more of a synergist, meaning that it helps out the lats. And because this muscle is really much more of a synergist, we don't need to worry all that much about this antagonist part here. Like we said before, this muscle does assist the lats, and it is not part of the rotator cuff. Speaking of that rotator cuff, the rotator cuff is made up of four different muscles. We have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. Now the rotator cuff does do a few different things, but no surprise, the main thing the rotator cuff does is it rotates the shoulder. Because the rotator cuff does help to move the shoulder in multiple different directions, it could have different antagonists. Oftentimes pec major is one of those antagonists, but of course there could be others as well. Rotator cuff injuries are common and problematic and that's because these rotator cuff muscles are very small and spindly. Honestly, they're really almost more tendinous than they are muscly in the first place. Because they're so tendinous, unlike other muscles, they don't heal well when damaged and often require surgery. And when it comes to remembering the different rotator cuff muscles, I like to use sits. So you have supraspinatus, that's S, you have infraspinatus, that's I, you have teres minor, that's T, and you have subscapularis, that's S, sits. 
S-I-T-S. -S. And next up, we have the most famous upper body muscle, biceps brachii. This muscle does elbow flexion and it also supinates the forearm. The antagonist here would be the triceps. And this muscle is called the biceps because it has two different origins or two different heads or regions. Next up, we have the brachialis. And I like to think of the brachialis as the biceps underappreciated brother. And the reason the brachialis is underappreciated is because it does the same action that the biceps do. It does elbow flexion. And the brachialis is typically stronger than the biceps. You just never think of your brachialis or see your brachialis because it's a deeper muscle than your biceps. And next up we do have the triceps brachii and those are these big old muscles here on the backside of your upper arm. So when we're talking about the triceps we're talking about extension of the elbow and shoulder. The triceps affect the elbow joint more than the shoulder. They perform this arm straightening motion. And like we said before the biceps and the triceps oppose each other so this should make sense right here. Here. And fun fact about the triceps, the triceps make up about 55% of upper arm mass. The biceps come in at about 30%. So if you want really big muscular arms, building up your triceps might actually be the most important thing. So there's quite a few things that we're not covering today. One of those things would be the muscles of the forearm and hand. Just like in the lower body video where we didn't cover foot muscles, it's rare to see any of these muscles in the hand or forearm come up on a test, and you'll most likely never need to know any of them by name. Understanding the different motions of the hand, forearm, or wrist could be useful information for you to have though. We also skip some of the back muscles surrounding the spine, even some more of the notable ones like the multifidus for example. Like many of the muscles located in the hand or forearm, it's rare for you to need to know all of these different muscles by name. Also, many of them are more useful for support of the spine rather than specific movements. We skipped a few smaller muscles in the upper body, such as the anconius, for instance, and the anconius, for the most part, assists the triceps. We also didn't talk about the coracobrachialis, which helps to flex and adduct the shoulder. There are many muscles like both of those two that are good to know about, but they are far less important than the ones that we talked about today. We also didn't cover any head or face muscles, and we didn't really cover any neck muscles either, with maybe the exception of levator scapula, and that's because those muscles, well, it just won't be necessary for almost any of you guys watching this video to know them. Neck muscles like your scalenes and your sternocleidomastoid or SCM are pretty important though, and you very well could end up doing some research on those later. In my opinion, knowing what we went over today, as well as what was discussed in my other two videos, well, knowing that stuff should be more relevant to most of you, and of course, that's why we went over it. Hopefully you guys found everything that we went over helpful, and if you haven't checked out these other two anatomy videos, I'd highly recommend that you do. If you guys have any questions, or comments, make sure to leave those down below. As always, I will respond to them. And if you haven't done so already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel because both of those things really do help the channel to grow and that does allow me to create more free content for all of you. Thanks for watching everyone and until next time, stay sort of healthy.